Hi, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Mason Ritchie, uh, senior contributor here at the Asia Society Korea uh, and also a professor at Hankook University of Foreign Studies. Uh, and we are happy to have everyone joining us uh, today on this uh, fantastic uh, webinar uh, about North Korea's uh, asymmetric uh, capabilities. Uh, we have three uh, tremendous experts uh, who have uh, taken time for their busy schedules to join us today. I'll introduce them uh, momentarily. Before I do so, uh, I just want to uh, let everyone know sort of the idea behind uh, this webinar, behind this panel. Uh, you know, for those who follow the Korean Peninsula, uh, we hear so much about North Korea's uh, uh, nuclear weapons program. Uh, that's usually what gets the headlines. Uh, that's what we hear about when we talk about um, uh, de you know, denuclearization as a part of negotiations with North Korea. <clears throat> uh, and beyond that, we obviously you know, frequently hear about North Korea's conventional military capabilities, uh, you know, its artillery pieces, uh, the size of its army, uh, the state of its airport, for instance, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I think to some degree, we perhaps don't pay quite enough attention to North Korea's asymmetric uh, capabilities. Uh, increasingly, I think it's the case that we do that with cyber, which is what we'll talk quite a bit about today. Um, but I think probably not enough, uh, honestly, given uh, the rapid changes uh, that we're seeing uh, in the cyber domain and uh, North Korea's uh, capabilities in that regard. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, the conventional, uh, so the, the uh, chemical and biological weapons programs, uh, again, also, I think, get sort of a um, uh, uh, second fiddle status, uh, if you will, uh, compared uh, to the nuclear weapons uh, program that uh, Pyongyang has. So I think we're going to try to balance that out a little bit today and talk some uh, about these uh, asymmetric capabilities. Uh, and as we see with cyber, that will, of course, also in some ways uh, fit in uh, with the nuclear dimension as well. Um, so uh, with uh, that sort of introduction uh, to, the, to the webinar, I just want to very briefly uh, introduce our uh, three uh, panelists today. Uh, in the first place, we have uh, Dr. Young Jung Kim, who is professor at the National Security College of the Korean National Defense University. Uh, he's also uh, a member of the National Security Advisory Board for the Republic of Korea President's Office, uh, the Blue House. Uh, he is the author uh, of a, a monograph at Routledge <clears throat> that came out a few years ago uh, called The Origins of the North Korea Garrison State, the People's Army and the uh, Korean War. Uh, he also serves uh, the Prime Minister's Office uh, as an official reviewer on the Government Performance uh, uh, Review Board and, and, and also for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Unification. He's also an advisor at numerous other um, government security uh, and defense um, agencies uh, and ministries in Korea. Uh, thanks for joining us, uh, Youngjun. Uh, second of all, we have Dr. Sung Ho Lee, who is Professor of International Politics and Strategy in the Department of Political Science at Taejon University. He is also currently vice president of the Korea Convergence Security Association and advisor uh, to the Association uh, of the Republic of Korea Navy. Uh, previously, he has been uh, a researcher in the Department of uh, Security Strategy Studies at the Sejong Institute and also a research fellow uh, at the Korea Research Institute for Strategy, or CRIS, for those of you who know that. Uh, prior to being at Taejong University, he was uh, adjunct professor at Gyeonggi University at Hanam. Um, and during his doctoral studies in the United Kingdom, he served as a research fellow for the chief of the defense staff uh, and the professional head of the British Armed Forces. Uh, his PhD is uh, in strategic studies from King's College London. <clears throat> and uh, last but certainly not least, we have uh, Dan Pinkston uh, joining us, uh, an old friend of mine. Uh, he is currently lecturer in international relations at Choi, Choi University. Uh, previously, uh, he was the deputy head for Northeast Asia at the International Crisis Group. Uh, he's an expert on the North Korean uh, military, North Korean political system, uh, including uh, its cyber programs, its nuclear weapons program, its chemical and biological uh, weapon systems. He has more publications than um, I can possibly uh, announce here. Uh, his PhD was at uh, UC San Diego uh, under Steph Haggard, uh, about whom he has some very interesting stories, uh, at least to have heard them uh, the last time that we were together having drinks. Uh, 
so perhaps uh, uh, all of you out there will have a chance to meet his meet him at some point and uh, be regaled by Dan's fabulous tales of what it's like to defend um, your PhD at UC San Diego under Steph Haggard, who was apparently really fantastic. And I don't mean that ironically, I mean that great. Uh, greatly uh, uh, speaks volumes for for how wonderful Steph was in it as, as an advisor and how funny he can be. Uh, so uh, with that uh, having been said, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, and I'm going to pose a question, uh, I think, um, to start with uh, to Professor Lee. Uh, but then I'll uh, be happy for Jun or, or Dan to jump in uh, whenever you want. Uh, in, in the first place, what do we know about North Korea's cyber capabilities? both in terms of cyber warfare uh, and cyber tools for illicit action. So ransomware, hacking-based uh, espionage uh, in these types of activities. I mean, North Korean uh, cyber capability has been uh, exponentially growing over the last 10, 15 year period. Initially, their uh, 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 level of their, their, their cyber capability was limited to the level of uh, elementary uh, DDoS attack. Uh, that slightly moved, uh, uh, updated, upgraded to like uh, uh, mixing various hacking techniques that resulted in, uh, you know, a bit more serious damage eventually. And eventually they, they, the cap capabilities grow. And at the current level, uh, their North Korean uh, capabilities considered to be one of the top uh, next to, uh, to China and, and, and Russia. And now North Korean level has reached to the, uh, to the, to the level that they now, they are one of their, their, their hacking organizations received, uh, 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 I guess, an honor of getting a title of APT-38. APT means Advanced Persistent Threat, which is considered to be the, uh, the top range uh, level of, uh, of capability when it uh, comes to carrying out hacking and uh, and creating result. Yeah, so just uh, you know, I'm by no means a cyber expert, um, so I'm I'm, but I, so I don't want to to sell myself as more than I am. But uh, for the uh, for the acronym uh, ignorant in this regard, uh, a DDoS is a distributed denial of service attack, uh, which yes, basically, basically is just, like uh, a, you are you are overflowing the uh, the the internet. Uh, I mean, like a network connection, so that nobody can really uh, connect to the service that the particular uh, provider provides. Yes. There we go. So so a DDoS attack floods uh, the the network uh, and basically shuts down the network that way. Yeah. And uh, uh, APT is an advanced persistent APT. threat, which is a U.S. APT government designation right. for high level um, uh, yeah. hacker groups. Uh, uh, Dan, uh, maybe you want to jump in there and let us, you know, let us know uh, a little bit more, pick, picking up on that, you know, the the level and the the, the development of North Korea's cyber capabilities. Sure. Um, yeah. First of all, great to see everyone, and uh, thanks for inviting me to this um, webinar. I think if we looked at it um, in terms of uh, functions, there are four main functions in how North Korea uses its cyber capabilities. The first is espionage. The second I would say is disruption or destabilization operations. The third I would say is cyber crime to earn foreign exchange, hard currency. And the fourth I would say is influence operations to shape and influence public opinion uh, you know, about North Korea and about uh, issues that are important to, to North Korea surrounding the, the peninsula and so forth. Um, so in terms of uh, cyber crime, you know, they have uh, been able to take a lot of tools off the shelf. They're very um, adaptive and able to um, use tools that have been linked. Um, however, we've seen that some of the, the um, uh, countermeasures have been um, uh, improved recently. We've seen some of the, the ransomware attacks in the U.S. recently against the Colonial Pipeline, for example. And there's a much more rapid um, resolution of the attribution problem. And I think it's becoming more difficult for North Korea um, to earn money uh, through these uh, cybercrime uh, activities. Uh, their influence operations are not as developed as Russia or China, for example, or Iran. Um, however, they do have the, the full scale 
uh, of uh, computer network uh, operations and uh, capabilities. Um, I would say they're a second tier. They're not as good as the Russians or the Chinese or the Americans or the Israelis, but just below that top tier, they're quite uh, capable. Um, if, I, if I can just ask you a, a, a brief um, sort of follow-up there. Um, the, uh, the influence operations, um, you know, to what extent are those primarily directed against South Korea? And to what extent uh, do you think that those are directed um, uh, against the, U the US or, or Japan or other adversaries? I would say they're mostly directed at South Korea and at the Korean diaspora around the world. Um, I doubt they have the, the human uh, capacity to uh, have large scale operations against the US or Europe and, or Japan for that matter. Like we've seen that the Russians are like the, the masters of this, they're the, the world champions of this. But I think if there were um, a conflict or if the armistice were to collapse and let's say there were political decisions to be made um, about intervention or coming to the aid of South Korea, for example, they might want to step that up um, to try to influence public opinion in other countries um, as far as trying to shape the optics of the war and the cost of intervention and all of that. But I would say that they're, they're much further behind, say, uh, Russia or China, which are more advanced. Great. Um, Youngjun, why has North Korea developed these cyber capabilities? Why is that something that they've put a lot of efforts into? I mean, if, if they've developed as rapidly as, as Professor Lee and, and, and Dan are telling us, um, you know, they've obviously invested quite a bit in that. Um, I assume, assume both on the, the human capital and human development side of things, but also on the, um, the, the hardware uh, and software side of things. So they've obviously put an effort on this. Uh, why, why is that? Why is a resource um, constrained country like North Korea spent so much um, effort uh, developing this capability? Yeah, uh, because of money issue or resources issue in terms of the uh, cost of benefit analysis of you, as a uh, matter of fair, including cyber capabilities are much more efficient than conventional military capability. Now is a uh, KPA, Korean People's Army doesn't have any kind of good resources for maintaining good training or exercise, even gas or food or even basic uh, system. So uh, in terms of cost benefit, uh, Kim Jong-un uh, uh, cannot avoid this kind of option. And also cyber is very good for the uh, psychological warfare, already Daniel said, it is about uh, the election uh, campaign or the Russian cases for the uh, US presidential election. So uh, cyber is a much more diverse option. And also uh, already Daniel said about this uh, getting money as a cyber warrior is not just to focus on military uh, capability, but also uh, getting money from the uh, Bitcoin blockchain or whatever. So uh, it will be a diverse option. And also uh, the KP has a, uh, does not have a, a, a good uh, human capability. Uh, for example, my uh, colleagues, Dr. Kim Jim Mo, former Kaida uh, Research Fellow, uh, have a lot of interview with the uh, director of the KPA. Uh, they on the KPA office core have a two op carry option. One is a very good family background. There's very few. And what most of KPO, KPA officer has a very bad uh, family background and um, they don't want to get back after their military services. So uh, their quality of office support is not very good. So uh, because of this kind of diverse issue, logistic issue, human capital issue, Kim Jong-un cannot avoid this kind of automatic option in maximizing their capability in attack uh, South Korea or even potential uh, enemy country like the uh, US. You just mentioned uh, the KPA. Um, the Korean People's Army. <clears throat> um, how are these cyber capabilities organized um, by the North Korean state uh, and by the party? I mean, you know, which, which parts of the regime, which offices uh, uh, are responsible for developing these capabilities? Uh, you know, are they organized into sort of you know, one uh, one mass of cyber units, or are they distributed, you know, throughout the the defense and security apparatus of North Korea? 
uh, you know, to whom do these cyber units and cyber offices report? I mean, to what extent are they managed by the bureaucracy or to what extent do they report directly to, to Kim Jong-un and, and, and his, uh, his office? I'll start perhaps with you, Professor Kim, you can answer that. And then I'll ask Professor Lee and Dan to jump in on that too. Yeah, we uh, understand it is not exactly information, but um, the, uh, the rock army understand the uh, KP has a Bureau of Cyber Affairs uh, in, inside of the KP, we call it Chongchal Chunggu. Uh, we call it the Bureau of the, uh, the Reconnaissance or uh, the information and about the six, around 6,000 cyber warrior uh, inside of North Korea. Maybe some part of the, uh, the office in, will be definitely in China. And, and so uh, they have uh, developed the, their uh, human capability. Uh, but when I was yeah, working at the uh, uh, FMSO, uh, at the Fort Lebanon in the US Army, uh, we tried to, how many young North Korean were educated in Chinese university for computer science, but we cannot find any kinds of uh, uh, exact data, but um, maybe we guessing uh, some use North Korean study uh, 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 in the uh, Chinese university the, the, as a the, uh, foreign student for computer science, uh, maybe bachelor uh, process or ma even master courses or something like that. And then maybe they are uh, uh, working for the other uh, government in China or in North Korea. Dan, you wanna jump in on that? How, how, is, how, is, how are the cyber capabilities organized within the Korean state? Sure, this, it's a little bit confusing because of course, um, North Korea engages in um, denial and deception. And they try to conceal the, the real names of this. And then it's compounded by the problem that um, outside organizations, uh, foreign organizations like to coin their own terms. So you will see, for example, Microsoft has coined the term a thallium. They use um, elements for uh, cyber actors um, internationally. Um, another popular cybersecurity firm, Kaspersky, they call them uh, what, Kimsuki or something like that. So you will see in the, in the press and in the literature, this confusion over the names. And then of course, the, the North Koreans have their own names that they use internally. And of course, if you are a um, prudent dictatorship, you would like to have um, redundancy in your security um, operations and your security um, organizations. So, um, you know, you have to have monitoring and surveillance, especially over this um, technical uh, area of cyber. So we think that under the, the KPA general staff department, there are cyber capabilities um, under um, the control of the general staff department. And under the general staff department, I think there are two uh, bureaus, the command automation bureau, and then the enemy operations bureau. Um, and under those bureaus are offices. So, that, for example, there's Office 31 that um, uh, develops hacking tools. Um, Office 56, which develops software for their own uh, command and control of their uh, military. Um, under the Enemy Operations Bureau, there's Office 204, which is engaged in hacking and influence operations. They um, deploy phishing emails. Um, which we saw just this week. I just saw a press report today that there was, uh, you know, phishing uh, attacks uh, from a couple of days ago. Um, and those phishing emails target um, primarily, you know, South Korean government agencies or the military. Some will uh, uh, target uh, foreign firms or U.S. military, Japanese military looking for um, plans and um, technology. And then there's the Reconnaissance General Bureau, which Professor Kim said, this Chong Chong Chao Guk, which probably some people say it's under the, the uh, in the organizational chart of the hierarchy under the General Staff Department. And they say it's probably under the um, State Affairs Commission. But all of these organizations, of course, under tight party control and surveillance. So under the RGB, you see redundancy in some similar types of capabilities. And under the RGB, there are other offices and departments. And the RGB conducts covert operations, attacks against the South, infiltrating um, special agents, sinking the Chonan and so forth, those types of operations. Um, there's a, a office or department 121, 
under the RGB, which conducts the computer network operations, you know, espionage, exfiltrating um, files and information. There's a Office 91 that we believe is under the RGB that conducts cyber attacks. So as far as any kind of cyber weapons, you know, like um, Stuxnet or something like that, that would attack, um, you know, industrial uh, controls and, and um, you know, other types of um, uh, targets. Um, and then there's a, a 110 Institute, um, which they've deployed or supposedly have deployed uh, cyber operatives abroad. So in China, you know, possibly Southeast Asia. And then there's the Korea Computer Center, which runs the, the intranet, the Kwang, Kwangmyeongsong in, uh, or Kwangmyeong in, um, in North Korea. And then there's probably for some uh, internal surveillance and monitoring, um, probably the Ministry of State Security, the Ministry of People Security might have some, you know, kind of cyber or monitoring um, capabilities. And then for influence operations abroad, uh, you know, probably the United Front Department, which runs the Twitter accounts and websites for like Uri Min Jokiri, um, you know, targeting the Korean diaspora abroad to, to shape their, their thinking about the Korean Peninsula. And of course, the Propaganda and Agitation Department, um, you know, shapes um, all of the content of this to make sure it um, is consistent with the party uh, doctrine and uh, policies and so forth. But basically all of this stuff and the important things are under control of the party and the senior uh, party leadership. So there's a couple of things there that you that you brought up that I would like to come back to, um, uh, but I'll, I won't get to it right away. One of them is, um, you know, cyber cyber defense on their side. You know, I mean, we seem to have some idea of their cyber uh, you know, offensive cyber capabilities, but how's their cyber defense, right? Um, and then you also brought up the um, cyber command and control. Um, you know, and, and you know, is that an attack surface that that because of their use of offensive cyber capabilities, you know, in the way that that's been integrated into to to their defense, you know, does that open up vulnerabilities for their command and control for their for their nuclear weapons, for instance? You you mentioned the attribution problem earlier, you know, and again for those of you who are tuning in or not, you know, really up to speed on on cyber security issues, attribution problem refers to the uh, difficulty. Uh, which Dan says uh, is being ameliorated uh, in uh, correctly identifying uh, who carries out a cyber attack. Um, and this fits in with the larger question of, of cyber deterrence. Um, you brought that up. And I, here I want to sort of use that as kind of my, my, my connection point to something that I want to, to ask to Professor Lee. Um, you know, how many of these uh, cyber attacks, how many of these uh, cyber warriors that North Korea has uh, are located outside of North Korea, right? How much of the hacking takes place from locations outside of Korea, or, or do we have an idea of that? And we heard China mentioned earlier, perhaps places in Southeast Asia, I'm not sure. So how much of it takes place outside of Korea? Um, why would that be the case? Uh, and how does that fit into the attribution problem? Does that make it harder to attribute attacks? It is, it is difficult to, to give you exact numbers, but, but we know for sure that the North Korean operations do take in such places in China and elsewhere. I mean, that, that is the all the information I, can, uh, I have or I can give, I guess. And the problem with attribution, I mean, is it a good way to uh, attri uh, uh, evade uh, uh, attribution? I don't think so. I mean, it is a good way to conduct business, like uh, uh, cryptocurrency hacking or, or create a, a, a basis for like, a, a, like a, you know, like receiving orders. Uh, from uh, individuals or corporations or government agencies to carry out maybe DDoS attacks or uh, ransomware attacks. Uh, so that those those area, uh, places that that, that that North Koreans might have uh, outside of uh, North Korean territory would be an outlet for business more like rather than uh, uh, a point of uh, launching attacks. Because uh, if 
the trip attribution uh, problem uh, goes. I mean, I mean, if if the the, the North Korean attack is is attributed to uh, an area, and for example, in China, that's going to create a, a major international incident. And uh, as we know, that the attribution problem is the, one of the biggest uh, burden for uh, those who want to uh, retaliate any kind of cyber attack. Like for conventional attacks or, or non-conventional attacks, yeah, definitely you know who did that, who, who attacked, you know whom. But in case of uh, uh, cyber warfare, it is very difficult. You might have some idea. We know that it was North Korea that attacked Korea repeatedly and uh, and infiltrated uh, 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 United States, even crashed system, phony system, and launched all these. You know, ransomware attack, including the recent uh, pipeline uh, attacks in in, in in the United States, and uh, there is a, a doctrine, actually military doctrine, in place to be to giving the power uh, to retaliate with military uh, hardwares or, or or means of uh, uh, military non cyber means to retaliate uh, perpetrator, but but and and we know once again that that North Korea did a lot of these. But it is not really possible to, to retaliate, really. I mean, how are you going to retaliate? North Korean uh, uh, cyber network is basically air-gapped. It is very, very difficult to determine the point of infiltration, penetration, for example. So what kind of attack can we, uh, uh, re uh, retaliation can we take? I mean, do we bomb North Korean because of uh, cyber attacks? No. So that's why uh, North Korean cyber attacks and uh, North Korean preference towards cyber cyber uh, uh, attack is efficient and effective and cost effective at the same time, and they can they are they are free from uh, uh, this attribution problem. Although there is attribution possible, you see, this is the kind of dilemma. It's not just North Korea, but between United States and China, United States and Russia, and such and such. And these influence, uh, influence uh, operations, for example, that you, we know that North Korea is, uh, it has been doing this, uh, I call it cyber psychological warfare for over the last, uh, like, I mean, like uh, several decades, and it's been intensified with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the cyber uh, capabilities. But what do we do? What can we do? I, I think that's it. I think that's an excellent set of points, and, and I, I, the way that you just described that sort of summarizes the asymmetric side of this. I mean, even if, okay. even if we know that North Korea does something, or are reasonably sure that it's North Korea that's responsible, that is responsible for an attack, uh, it's not. It's not at all obvious, you know, how to retaliate, which of course, you know, undermines the possibility of deterrence um, by by punishment. Uh, obviously, deterrence by denial doesn't seem to be working very well. <laughs> um, For example, I mean, I mean, like a North Korean nuclear missile capabilities, right? This, I mean, I mean, they, 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 they were. I mean, there's no way they can they can deny they have nuclear weapons and and, and missile, and they they get sanctions. They they were punished like retaliated with sanctions and 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 such. But with uh, cyber capability, I mean, what kind of sanctions can we, you know? <laughs> place against uh, North Korea, so you have to you have to see that that as uh, the aspect of uh, as asymmetric aspects of the problem here. Great, thanks for that. I want to come back to cyber again. Um, we're we're not leaving it behind, but I do want to shift over and talk a little bit about chemical and biological weapons for a while. Um, I, I I think I'm realizing now that we could have done an, an entire hour or even more just on cyber, but. Uh, we need to, to move over at least a little bit and talk about the chemical and biological weapon side of things. And then we'll come back to, to cyber and, and sort of, you know, close out again with a sort of comparative look, I guess, at cyber and the chemical and biological um, weapon situation. Uh, so I'll start again with a sort of basic question. Uh, maybe I'll start with, uh, with Dan on this. How developed and capable are, are North Korea's chemical and biological weapons? Okay, first on... Um one of the problems in, in the literature, in, in the South Korean literature in particular, they will combine chemical and biological agents together, but they're very um, different, of course. So first on, um, I'll say, I'll go with uh, biological weapons first, because I'm pretty skeptical about some of the, the claims. There have been claims that North Korea acquired um, smallpox virus, um, you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed and so forth. Um, I think the, the, the North Koreans, um, you know, do not have an active 
or a deployed biological weapons capability because of their public health uh, system. We see how paranoid they are with the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, you know, biological weapons are very um, dangerous. And of course they don't discriminate. So if uh, a pathogen gets out, it affects your own people, your own troops and everything else. So I'm pretty skeptical, although they do have the, the capabilities to develop biological weapons. The, most, the one I would be most worried about is anthrax, which is actually the name of the disease. Bacillus anthresis is the, um, the agent or the spores. It occurs in nature. It's easy to make um, for a state like North Korea. Um, and it's not contagious. So you could deploy that. Um, it's, uh, you have to do it under the right conditions. Um, but I think that would really be a very, very uh, provocative, um, uh, you know, that would trigger retaliation. But I think that would be, you know, a kickoff for, for like a, a major invasion or major conflict when they were just going to go for broke. You know, a couple of guys could fly in for, to Incheon Airport, have it in a suitcase, set up uh, um, a device in Myeongdong in the middle of Seoul, in the right conditions, this stuff could uh, spray out a, on a rooftop. And then in about a week or so later, you would, you know, thousands of people could start showing up at hospitals uh, with anthrax. So that's my, my biggest concern, but on the biological weapons side, but chemical weapons is another um, story. Uh, they have a large stock of chemical weapons. They have not signed the chemical weapons convention and their official policy is denial. They deny that they have any chemical weapons, but of course it's no secret, um, you know, after uh, Kim Jong-un's older half-brother, Kim Jong-nam was um, killed with a VX nerve agent in the Kuala Lumpur airport. So um, on chemical weapons, the open source literature says they have between what, about 2,000 500 kilograms to 5,000 kilograms. We've seen that for about two decades or so. There's no update in that. Um, but their nerve agents um, and probably blister agents like mustard gas are the, probably the main um, agents. Um, and they would probably use that in um, artillery, would probably be the main delivery system, I think, in uh, wartime if they were to use those weapons. Uh, Yung, Yungjun, you want to jump in there and maybe tell us a little bit about how uh, chemical and perhaps biological weapons uh, fit into North Korea's uh, strategy and tactics. Uh, you know, Dan seems to be indicating it's primarily a you know war fighting uh, 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 tools rather than uh, than fitting into some other you know form of strategy or tactics. But maybe you can let us know like what the you know yeah what the strategic approaches that North Korea takes uh, towards the potential use of these agents? Yeah, uh, the chemical and biological issue is a very sensitive issue to North Korea, as you already know. Nuclear missile is uh, uh, they are proud of the showing off their uh, nuclear missile capability. But when every, every time we talk about the uh, chemical biological weapon, they absolutely uh, North Korea uh, applies it in possessing it and um, uh, using it. And so, uh, so far, we, we don't have many information, as uh, Daniel already said, yeah, we only have a very limited information, largely depends on defector uh, from North Korea, which is not uh, certain uh, information. But um, Joseph Bermuda of the USA KIA report is uh, one of the uh, only available sources for the, uh, uh, the uh, this kind of information. So. Uh, 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 back to the nation question about the uh, the uh, effect, strategic effect of the uh, uh, chemical and biological weapon is is absolutely uh, uh, significant. Uh, when we uh, plan for the uh, combined military exercise between the Iraq and U.S. Army, we uh, always uh, think about the, the early stage is the most important uh, stage for the uh, KPA in invading uh, South Korea. At the time, uh, we consider about the nuclear missile weapon uh, as well as the uh, biological chemical weapon. How uh, KPA use this one? They really use this one, and when they use this one, how can we uh, uh, react this kind of a capability? So uh, this is more like the psychological effect rather than actually using this one. Uh, many people don't think about North Korea actually use. Uh, chemical and biological weapon in South Korean territory, which they want to occupy, 
because of their lung problem. So uh, it's more like a psychological effect when, especially early stage, uh, the first preemptive strike and then uh, kind of concern. So uh, in having it, it is uh, 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 only having it is already a, a, lot, a lot of the psychological burden to the rock army. And um, uh, this is uh, not 100% uh, possibly to defend it. So it's more like a psychological effect rather than actually a user thing. From my oh. personal opinion. So, so if I'm understanding you correctly, then Jun, you, you're making the argument that uh, you know, there, there might be you know, a, a tactical you know, or operational plan to use these weapons, but a significant part of the value is the psychological effect that they have on the US and ROC military here. Uh, and that the US and ROC military have to you know, plan around that uh, just you know, dumb question. I, I know Dan, you were in you were in the Air Force, and, and Yunjun, obviously, you were in the military, as was Songho, I believe. Uh, you know, did you have, did you ever have to do any exercises wearing a, a protective suit? Is that something that happens in the exercises when they actually carry out the the, the field exercises? Or do you have to put on the the, the yeah, hood absolutely. or the, the full chemical suit and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially in the field of artillery exercise, always is thinking about that kinds of the uh, situation that the uh, biological and chemical uses uh, for the field actually a uh, site or something like this. So uh, adding to mask for uh, COVID-19, we have to have a kind of the uh, all wearing the uniform. Maybe you can see every August in the, the uh, subway station or wearing some kind of this almost impossible to move or uh, to uh, to uh, uh, doing something, so yeah, we, we prepare for that, but very, very exhaustive in uh, in exercising and defending that kind of chemical and biological exercise. Do we do we have any evidence that North Korea proliferates uh, these weapons to other countries? Just let me add a little bit about the uh, chemical weapons use in uh, in North Korean military. I mean, chemical weapons is uh, is a, a, an integral part of North Korean military doctrine and operation concept, because uh, the lack of uh, conventional capability that they will need uh, a, a punch, a breakthrough. They they need uh, to make a breakthrough or bridge, not only in the front line, but in the behind the lines as well, because their doctrine preaches speedy resolution due to the lack of uh, uh, their ability, ability to, uh, to maintain the tempo. So one of the best options is nuclear weapons. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, chemical weapons. They can just use chemical weapons to punch a hole, or they can use, I mean, especially that the North Korea has, uh, has, has far imperial you know, air capability, that they can use cap uh, uh, chemical weapons to, uh, to attack joint uh, Korean-US uh, airfields. Or, or, or neighbor bases. So it is very important that, 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 that North Korea maintain that capability. So it, it is a different uh, asymmetric capability compared to, to, uh, uh, to cyber warfare, but it is nonetheless have much more psychological that, you know, means than uh, much more, more, more actual uh, uh, relevance than, than, than psychological warfare, if I just may add, yeah. Okay, great. Thank, thanks for the, for correcting me on that. Do we have an idea whether or not uh, the new artillery that they've been testing over the last few years, you know, notably, uh, you know, these uh, I'll, I'll call them clones of you know the Iskander missiles or the U.S. ATACMS. You know, do we know whether or not uh, they have warheads that have been outfitted uh, for these new artillery pieces? Uh, warheads are retrofitable, basically. So they can uh, use conventional, yeah, conventional munition, warhead, or, or chemical. They can all be retrofitted. Yes. Okay. Especially well, the well, caliber, I mean, like uh, 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 weapons, uh, like a multiple rocket launcher system, large caliber ones, and uh, you know other surface, surface to surface missiles. Yes, of course. Okay, last question on the, on the chemical and biological weapons. Um, do, do we have any evidence that North Korea has proliferated these weapons uh, to other countries? Anybody can jump in I can, on that. I can, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I would, on, you know, chemical weapons, we've seen, or there have been cases of 
uh, chemical defense equipment like gas masks or protective suits and so forth. But on chemical weapons, I don't think there are many buyers, right? There are just a couple of um, states that have not signed the CWC. Um, some would argue that there's a norm or taboo against the use of chemical weapons. So you don't have many buyers, maybe some non-state actors or terrorist groups. But then you have transactions cost problems and so forth. How are you going to carry that out? It would be very, very risky. So I think, um, you know, there are other arms sales they can make, you know, conventional weapons, small arms, RPGs, you know, those types of things. So I'm skeptical about that because of the, the you know, the risk of that. And, uh, you know, if they were to be caught and then the transactions cause problems with um, and information problems with non-state actors. Great. Um, all right, I'm going to jump back then to, to cyber um, and, uh, and, and close this out in the last 10 minutes that we have, um, you know, getting back, uh, getting back to cyber. Um, just one, just very basic question. How worried should the U.S. and South Korea be by North Korea's cyber capabilities? Like on a scale of one to 10, you know, how, how big a deal is North Korea's development of its cyber capabilities? And not only, of course, the capability itself, but also the intent behind it, the, you know, the strategy behind it. You know, how, how big does this or should this figure in the way that we look at North Korea compared to you know, other problems in North Korea or more generally, in fact? Cyber attack. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah, cyber attack is a, a everyday problem. It's not just for the military issue, but also the nuclear power plant or non help or Sony hacking scandal. We, we already uh, feel everyday uh, life. And um, also, Raghu is concerned about the uh, uh, first one is uh, capability of North Korea cyber attack is uh, related to the uh, 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 fake news or SNS operation, uh, especially in preparing for the uh, last US presidential election. It's an old story over the seven decades, always uh, North Korea intervention, South Korean election was elected. But anyway, uh, North Korea uh, want to uh, uh, use SNS site in uh, the, uh, leading the, uh, uh, the fake news or uh, uh, the uh, favorite opinion for North Korea in, into the uh, uh, presidential election. Uh, secondly, uh, is uh, some possibility, not not so far, uh, but possibility for the future collaboration between North Korea, China, and Russia will be disaster and nightmare. Uh, so far, uh, we didn't uh, catch on any ed evidence. But um, I, under the situation of a U.S.-China strategic competition, maybe it is possible to collaborate between PLA, uh, KP, or Russian army and uh, KP, or between the triangle. Even the vast exercise, maybe 2022, maybe a triple country can have a, a combined exercise on cyber operation against Japan, U.S., South Korea. It will be possible picture if the U.S.-China uh, strategic competition is getting more tense. So we concern about the, the, the first one issue and also second this kind of a collaboration between the ASEAN countries. Great. Maybe if I can ask my question like a different way and like turn it around a little bit and I'll get Professor Lee to maybe jump in on this. How effective is cyber deterrence against North Korean hacking? Like how, how good is our deterrence, both South Korea and, and the, the U.S.? I explained already that there is a very limited capability or limited, uh, limited scope for to, to retaliate against North Korean cyber capability. Uh, but whereas North Korea, as you as you uh, asked, I mean, whether North Korean cyber capability will be, uh, you know, how threatening it is for joint uh, U.S. Korean forces. I mean, I mean, the North Korean capability will progressively grow, but you have to understand from two different perspectives. Uh, one is the uh, uh, one is the uh, you know, like a non-physical part, and the other is a kinetic warfare part. For example, uh, uh, if North Korean, as uh, one of the reports uh, indicated, that have actually developed the EMP weapons, electromagnetic pulse weapons, and those weapons, uh, are, are, I mean, those warheads, EMP warheads are, are used in, say, uh, new uh, uh, North Korean uh, super super missiles, for example, that represent a, a realistic kinetic and, and physical uh, threat. 
that is going to make a, a joint Korea US operation really, really difficult, if not impossible. Uh, also, uh, it has a lot to do with uh, a command and control capability or, or the psychological, uh, I'm sorry, signal and, and electronic warfare capability that is really integral to, to, to uh, modern warfare. Uh, in the kinetic sector, yes, I think eventually Korea and joint, joint Korea and US forces will be able to sustain North Korea, uh, North Korean onslaught, and eventually be able to, you know, take the lead. I mean, take care of North Korean uh, uh, onslaught, but otherwise, especially in the uh, psychological area, non-kinetic area, the the threat will will uh, grow to the extent that that sometimes it might be just difficult to deal with it. I mean, I mean, other than in the in the time of warfare, that in the emergency, maybe there can be some emergency measures to to restrain North Korean uh, uh, psychological onslaught. But otherwise, during the peacetime, during the uh, time of crisis, where these uh, uh, restrictive measures cannot be in place, I mean, there will be you know definite limit, and North Korean threat will actually limit uh, to reach the, the, uh, its height during that period. All right. So it sounds like, uh, you know, if deterrence doesn't work very well, it sounds like, you know, building cyber resilience um, uh, is, a, is a really important task, um, both in South Korea and the U.S., you know, not only with respect to North Korea, but I guess also, you know, China and Russia as well. Um, Dan, I said I wanted to come back to this, and so I guess I'll do that with you to start with. But if either Jung Jun or Professor Lee want to jump in, you're welcome to. Um, to what extent is North Korea's use of uh, malicious cyber tools also present um, an attack surface for North Korea, um, you know, to what, you know, especially, you know, you know, from the U.S. and perhaps also from South Korea, I'm not sure. I mean, how vulnerable are they uh, to cyber intrusions, um, or at least to what extent do we know that? Yeah, I think they're, they're quite vulnerable, and I wouldn't uh, trade places with them. Uh, they're very um, adaptive and uh, very uh, creative. They're able to integrate um, cyber tools off the shelves, off the shelf, um, but they don't have a, a large private sector IT um, sector like South Korea does, or like the US, um, you know, Israel does, Russia and China. So they're, they're at a disadvantage, but the more active they are out in the internet, then we see them uh, more and we see those vulnerabilities. So this report, I was just reading about 30 minutes or an hour before this webinar started, there was a report today on uh, Yonhap News, the dis news, the discovery of um, some phishing uh, attempts a couple of days ago. And already the news report, and I, I can't uh, vouch for the report of the credibility of it, but at least to the, at least according to that report, they already identified the server where these attacks were coming from. So when they're active out in uh, cyberspace and if they're using hot points or they have botnets and other you know, computers that they're using, um, a lot of that's observable. So we've learned, um, we've learned their, uh, from their attacks at uh, disruption and causing destabilization in the, pa in the past, attacking banks and, and um, media outlets, for example. So I think uh, we're learning to be more resilient and of course, there's the human factor in this, the basic, um, you know, cybersecurity hygiene. So a lot of people have been um, lazy and lax, you know, click, clicking on the wrong link or whatever and getting uh, malware on their Ministry of Unification computer. Um, you know, there needs to be education and cooperation uh, across agencies, government, private sector, NGOs, think tanks, and then multinational uh, cooperation as well. Um, and I think we're getting better at that. So, um, you know, North Korea you, is, you know, using these methods um, to run a modern uh, economy and everything else being an outlier, um, you know, renegade um, actor in cyberspace um, in the long run, I don't think it's uh, to their benefit. And they have a number of vulnerabilities. Great, thanks, thanks a lot, super answer. Um, I guess I'll just uh, give each of you a, a final chance to, to say anything that has run through your head uh, during, the, during the session today, anything that I didn't cover or anything that you wish I would have asked and that you would have had a chance to talk about 
Um, I'll give each of you a, a minute uh, to say a final word and then uh, we'll close up uh, this webinar. Start with you, uh, Professor Kim. Well, he seems frozen. <laughs> okay, we'll, so, we'll go, okay, we'll go, so, we'll go, we'll go, just, we'll go Professor Lee. Yes, uh, for the foreseeable future, the, the North Korean efforts will be focused primarily on, uh, on economic financial sector. They are already focusing on uh, cryptocurrency. They are not just hacking cryptocurrency, but they are uh, mining their you know, own uh, cryptocurrency, uh, mostly Moderna, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, one of so-called like dark coin that can only be traded uh, very privately, like a Bitcoin. Once is people, it is people's misconception that, 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 that these Bitcoins and the cryptocurrencies are anonymous, but they are not. But whereas they're like uh, Moderna and, and other you know forms of dark currencies, they are they are they are they can actually be used anonymously. And uh, North Korea has been using uh, these uh, you know Moderna and, and similar coins not just to 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 make money but evade sanctions and and securing uh, critical uh, supplies from overseas. It is possible. So uh, for the for, for the for the possible future until the Corona nineteen uh, COVID nineteen ends. They'll be focusing more on financial uh, financial gains, and eventually, but their their capabilities would expand to uh, 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 advanced level espionage, and the eventually uh, towards uh, 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 influential operations, not to the level of Russians, but but similar to the level of maybe uh, China. I'm, I don't know, but but that's the the aim they are going to strive for. Uh, Soon enough, yes. Great, super rundown of the intentions and possible future strategy, uh, thanks. Okay, it looks like Professor Kim is back. Uh, you, you were frozen for a little while, but here you are again. Uh, any, any last uh, word? I'll give you a minute to uh, say anything that uh, uh, has run through your head that I didn't have a chance to let you speak about. Yeah, uh, uh, first of all, the, 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 thank you for the, uh, the conversation with uh, the great colleague, uh, Professor Lee Sang and uh, the, Dr. Daniel Kimson. And um, I, I, I learn a lot from the, uh, to the conversation. And I, I want to emphasize on the uh, uh, Kim Jong Un. His mindset is very different from Kim Jong Il, Kim Il Sung. He uh, absolutely focusing on nuclear and missile capability, but at the same time, he is a, a young leader. Uh, want to uh, the uh, more focus on science and technology, just like the historical tradition of the KPA. Kim Il Sung. Uh, Surprising already in the, the late 1940s and early 1950s, he is a role model in the science technology based on Soviet Army rather than Chinese PLA, because at the time, Chinese PLA is more like focus on art and um, uh, the kind of the, uh, uh, historical tradition, but Soviet Army is a historical tanks or uh, uh, kind of thing. So Kim Jong-un is uh, uh, naturally now is more like a focus on science and technology capability. That's why today is uh, the title is the uh, cyber uh, operation warfare. And um, uh, September 19 military agreement between the South and North Korea, when we plan for that, uh, uh, interestingly, Kim Jong-un's KP suggest all destruction of the old GP in the DMZ area. It was a very surprising for the Rock Army because of the Without GP, they don't have a GOP line. But um, at the time, Kim Jong Un has already different mind. He doesn't want to focus on conventional military art uh, artillery or army. More like focusing on asymmetric warfare. Uh, I totally change uh, change this uh, KPA uh, capability. So I call the this is a North Korean version of defense reform under the Kim Jong Un's leadership. So we need to uh, talk about more uh, in depth in uh, cyber capability or asymmetric warfare. That that for sure. Uh, so uh, today's competition is very helpful uh, for, for me. Great, all right. Cyber and asymmetric capabilities generally is a part of North Korean military reform in scare quotes. <laughs> uh, Dan, last word goes to you. Well, I think if we look at the balance of forces and look at North Korea in terms of uh, population, industrial capacity, economic capacity, it's conventional arms, technology, and so forth. It's at uh, uh, an extreme disadvantage, actually. So the asymmetric capabilities can off balance, um, you know, that uh, imbalance against North Korea. 
So I don't believe that the external world, the international community, uh, has any intention to launch a preventive war against North Korea. Um, there'd be no uh, appetite for that. So, um, but nevertheless, if for whatever reason, whatever pathway we got there, if the armistice were to collapse and we return to wartime conditions, North Korea is not in any um, position to fight a protracted war. So whatever the aims of the conflict, some limited aims, some kind of um, you know, limited you know, uh, land grab or whatever kind of political objectives they were, they were seeking you know, short from, from a, a you know, low level kind of uh, objective, uh, you know, using coercion to, lift, to, to ask for sanctions being lifted, a land grab to complete unification, whatever the aims were, um, North Korea is not in a position for a protracted war. So they have to achieve their objectives very uh, quickly. So that's how the asymmetric capabilities would come in. They would wish to deter intervention by South Korean allies from the United Nations Command and so forth. So they would, um, you know, try very uh, hard to, to prevent the inflow of resources, personnel, and so forth from uh, South Korean allies. And in peacetime, Having this uh, knowledge that they can deter the outside world, having these um, uh, asymmetric capabilities, they can focus on coup proofing internally. So if you look at the redundancy in how the KPA is organized, it's not an efficient um, organization and model for um, uh, conducting a conventional war. So all of the redundancy, all of the communication problems, all the politicization of the, the KPA, it's actually very weak. But so that's good for preventing a coup against the leadership, you know, keeping it fractured and redundant and so forth. Um, but they can't fight a, um, you know, combined arms, combined uh, forces uh, type of war. So this, you know, maintains uh, the internal stability to maintain the, uh, as they maintain the organizational structure for coup proofing. So it has that side benefit as well that I think is not mentioned uh, so much. Great, thank you so much. All right, well, our time is up. Uh, all three uh, of uh, our experts today, uh, Dan Pinkston, uh, Lee Sang-ho and Kim Young-jun, uh, I think have done an, an excellent job of giving us a primer uh, on North Korea's uh, asymmetric capabilities, notably cyber uh, and uh, chemical and biological weapons. Uh, I am grateful uh, to all three of them for taking time from their busy schedules uh, to speak with us today. Uh, on behalf of the Asia Society Korea, I, I want to thank uh, the three of them and also uh, all of you uh, who have tuned in uh, to this webinar, uh, either on the Asia Society Korea's YouTube channel uh, or directly on the portal uh, at the Asia Society Korea website. Uh, thank you very much, and please uh, stay tuned for uh, future programming from the Asia Society Korea. Thank you very much. Thank you.